Welcome back to the Lantern Rue Cycling Podcast for the start of the Classics season. Benji's hyped, Omloop yes. Hedden Blad, men and women's recap. Also, quick notes on Fulnardesh and Grand Camino. But the highlights, obviously, opening weekend. We'll have Kona recap tomorrow. As you know, this podcast is made possible by our show partner Zwift. The Tour of Watopia starts next week on Zwift. Five stages of riding with five new routes, unlocks, double XP, so your efforts help you to level up twice as quickly. If you want to check it out, you can see it through the link down below at Zwift.com for your seven-day free trial. But Omloop, big, big favorite. Well, for not before the race, Tom Pidcock said, ah, I'm not here to win. It's all about Wout. <laughs> I'm in no good shape. And Wout said, oh, I've been at altitude. I'm not here to win. They're lying, Benji. These people lie yeah. straight to our face. When those two line up, we always expect them to go for it. Whereas Quick Step, what did you expect from them with no real sprinter and with a under-the-weather Asgren we saw at uh, Algarve? Well, in Belgium newspapers, Lombard was pretty, uh, what can I say about it? He was saying similar stuff as you just said about Pitcock and Vanat in the sense that our oh, Jumbo thinks they're the best classics team now let them show it <laughs> so it turned out that uh we might see it today so let's take a look at what happened in this race initially we had a breakaway up the road so uh that's pretty interesting Ben Healy in there for Yef, Konishev for Bex, Unox, Hulgard, Oppers for Sport Vlaanderen, Holman for Movistar Pretty uh, much one of the better riders at Movistar when it comes to the cobbles. You don't have too many there, except for like Aramburu, Garcia, Cortina, and Erviti. Uh, Gronet for Arkea and Jorigi for BNB. In the breakaway, they got a bit of a gap in the peloton. Cherny was controlling that and Lotto uh, Yumbo. Not Lotto. Lotto and El Yumbo doesn't exist anymore, Benji. Yumbo Visma was controlling it in the peloton as well to make sure the gap wasn't huge there. We had some crashes today, which is unfortunate. Yeah. I think Lorenz Nassen. So, uh, he had a, a broken collarbone today. Next to that, Gaviria seems to have a crash where he was either holding his wrist or his collarbone, so yeah. that didn't look too great either. Plenty of other riders. Campanarts had a lot of bad luck today. Wanted to get that out of the way before we get to the uh, actual strategic points in this race. Between 80 and 70k to go, Lotto actually started doing stuff. And Ineos, they started one by one, pacing hard on sections and attacking with one or two riders. EF did the same like last year. Trying to send the rider up front by trying to attack before the actual cobble sections come about. But then an attack by Magnus Sheffield came in the same sense again. And it really started opening up near the Holloway when we saw Jumbo Visma moving to the front, setting a bit of a tempo towards the Holloway. Did you think that what do you th- what did you think their plan was at that point? Well, you look at this parkour, no Molenberg, and there's a long flat section, flat earth section before the moor, and Benji is of the strong belief that the moor's overrated, a kind of in omloop at least, in terms of destroying the race. Like <laughs> Yeah. And so if teams wanted to make a big difference, they need to start from that moment Benji said about seventy Ks to go. There's a collection of narrow roads and climbs put together with not too much uh, flat, particularly the Malbostrat, uh, Leiberg, Berendries, that sort of section as well. But, yeah, Ineos have got Pidcock, who they want to have in a smaller group. They've got Narvaez's punchy, quick step, don't have a sprinter, a premium one at least. Lotto Sudal, don't have Dali, and Vermeersch probably wants a small group or Van Moor or... Campana. So, so there's so many teams that want a small group. And that's why I think we saw some attacks. But we didn't really see – we didn't see Quickstep, Benji. I expected yep. Quickstep to start launching here with Lampard, Stieber and co. And they just, they just weren't there. Every now and then we saw a Quickstep rider trying to move with another attack. Lampard did it at some point as well throughout that area in the race. But Osgren seemed to be at the back of the peloton for quite a bit. and. Yeah. When we entered some of the cobble sections and hilly sections, he was at the back of the peloton and I was like, okay, this is not Asgren RVV last year. This is Asgren post-Algarve where he wasn't looking too insane and as a consequence of his COVID most likely isn't in the form that he uh, 
wanted to be in, perhaps. So perhaps we might see him better in April and so forth, but today Osgain was not going to make a difference for this race. Now, like you said, Jumbo was trying to set something up. We didn't necessarily know what at that point, but we had the Holloweg and the Wolvenberg as two points where something can happen. And it seems like on the Holloweg they upped that tempo, but on the Wolvenberg they stopped doing that. And that's when we saw attacks by others. And Degenkolb was one of the riders that attacked on the Wolvenberg with two other riders, but that was closed down relatively quickly. Um, and as a consequence of that, opportunities arose once again after the Wolvenberg on the middle area between the Wolvenberg and the next couple of uh, following couple sections by the likes of uh, Stefan Kuhn, Vermeers, Florian Vermeers here, not Johnny, and also Loic Vliegen. These three riders actually got away with roughly 50k to go. And at that point, I was like, okay, teams should let these riders go. And then they caught the breakaway, these riders, which was already falling apart a tiny bit. But the gap went up and it started going up towards 50 seconds. And I texted you, I'm panicking. Doing in the breakaway with Florian <laughs> Ramirez, 50 seconds, only the mood. People need to take care of it. <laughs> nah. I was see for those guys, yeah, they're not gonna they're gonna lose a lot on the mood, probably. But yeah, I was like, I was like, 50's all right at 40 Ks to go or 35. It's it's okay. Yumbo had a lot of numbers. Van Hoydon can Afini were still kind of doing some work at that point. In corn too. Yeah, deep into the race. And this was different. We hadn't seen Van Aert Benji with his nose in the wind at all up to yep. this point. We haven't mentioned him. It's kind of like Asgren in E3 last year. He's in. He's not having to close anything. He's got Benut, Benut, sorry, <laughs> monitoring the front, Benut, <laughs> uh, the front of the race. And But I did say... You don't want to let those guys have 90 seconds. Let's get yeah. out. There was a plan. And unlike what we saw last year where it was Yumbo reacting to Stieber, Lampard, Asgren, Alaphilippe, DSM's one of their best riders that they let go, Daesh Benoit, already paying dividends for Yumbo Visma, not just defending but attacking. I think with Pidcock on his wheel after Morich and Trenton had, t had tried something with about 31 Ks to go. I think, was that on Berendries or the Leiberg? Yeah. Were you surprised to see that? Uh, I wasn't sure what they were going to try and force because on one end you have Wout van Aert, who's a pretty fast guy in a sprint. We've seen that quite a few times in the Tour de France last year. And next to that, you've got him as one of the stronger riders in the race on paper as well. So this can go two sides. Either they try and keep it into pacing and try and keep it into trying to lower the gap to the front and make sure they go it to a selective group sprint or they try and force something where a smaller group gets away. And it seems like the latter part was it. Because uh, we noticed that we had Benoit exactly making that move and Van Aert making that move. Van Aert wasn't the first one to get on the wheel, though. Narvaez was there and Pitcock. And those two riders getting to that wheel means Van Aert is also on the wheel because Pitcock, well, pretty good rider. We know that. He uh, knows him from Amstel. And then after that, they started kind of bridging up and there was one rider in the depths of the background that came through. Sonny Colbrelli was badly positioned, I think, at the foot of the Berendries and had to close the gap basically on the latter part of the Berendries and the section after it to make sure he's also with those four riders. So, situation of the race, still Kung and so forth in that front group for Meers, Loic Fliegen, with some of the breakaway riders, a chasing group now of five riders, including Colbrelli, Wout van Aert, Pitcock, Nervais, and also Tish Benoit. And then we had the peloton in which, well, Ahrein isn't riding because Colbrelli's there, Jumbo isn't riding, yeah, Tunis is just sitting up there, so which teams still control? It was Quick Step, right? Quick Step. Well, not for a bit. It yeah. was who Age of Two R who missed it initially. Age of Two R were pacing with a bit of DSM, and it took a while for Quick Step to come to the front with Asgren and Lampart. Which so Asgren was riding one hundred percent domestique, I think, for Seneschal, and so. Eventually, we've got the run into the moor. So the rest of Omloop is a bit of a watered-down course, run into the 900-meter, 8.6% moor, and then there's the Bosberg after that, and then there's like 13 k's to the finish uh, after the Bosberg. But the moor was the last hard climb, but there's a flash section before then. So this group of Ineos with Van Aert and Colbrelli and Benoit was working really well. And for 
Van Art. He's like, sweet, I've got a teammate, small group. <laughs> he was making Paul Brelly work. But they get to the lead group and it's got Kung and Vermeesh and a lot of tired breakaway riders in it. And I was like, don't know about the cooperation here. Initially, it was good because Kung and Vermeesh love to pull. So <laughs> they, they pulled a, a fair bit. But Ineos yep. were finessing Benji. We're in the run into the moor, and Navai's not pulling at all, sitting in. And I think that's what prompted what Benoit's move was, where he was like, I'm good, but if everyone from this group for the next 15Ks attacks me, I can't close down everything. And he went on the yep. offensive onto the moor. I think it was a fantastic move. Yeah, it was right before the Muir, uh, Muir even that we saw the attack by Benoit. And it wasn't really an attack attack. He said after the race where he basically got a bit of a gap and he realized, well, if I push through, I've got an actual attack ongoing, so might as well do it. And then Van Aert apparently told him, according to his interview, that oh, why not give it a go? And Benoit went. And the thing is with the Muir van Gerard is that he need quite a gap on the actual punchers to make sure he can make it. And that's where the interesting aspect came true. I was wondering what is... What Van Aert going to do now? Is he going to just sit up in the group? Most likely, because Benoit is ahead, he can use that guard. But on the other hand, if they sit up too much, which they started doing, this group is going to get caught. But Benoit is ahead then, and that's a situation in which we get to the Muur van Gerard is betting with that group of Van Aert just being caught at the foot of the Vesten of the Muur. And in all honesty, at that point, I was kind of guessing what's going to happen, and they go up to the Muur, and what team was taking control at the foot of the Muur? Kuhn. Well, Kuhn was pacing it for, yeah. for Van Aert. And then Van Aert at the top of the moor, he, I, I don't know if it was an attack, but it was kind of like his Kent Wevelhem last climb, Benji, where he just kept the, the pressure on the pedals. And I was like, why is he closing Benoit? Because Benoit had just made it over the top of the moor. Now, I don't know whether he was actually blocking because camera angle's changing, whether he was trying to get in front for the descent. I don't think so. You think he was putting the pressure on i think Wout was putting the pressure on and i was in doubt there because like he's once again the dude has quite a fast sprint we've seen it before so yeah. i saw i think turnison and another yumbo rider a bit behind them so yep. i was thinking okay if this group gets over the top with Wout van Aert in it he's got riders to actually keep it together and he can get a, a sprint going but that was clearly not what he was thinking because he actually properly hammered it, in my personal opinion, <laughs> towards the top of the Mur van Gerardsbergen. And just after the top, they basically closed it down towards Minode with a group of, what was it, 20 riders, 18, 17, something like that? A decent amount with Kuhn, Cole Brelli, Moric, Fred Wright, even Pidcock, no real dangerous quick steppers, maybe Stiebar, Victor Kampanats, who'd had about yes. like two crashes in a mechanical, <laughs> was there. He even attacked later, I think. Yes. Well, then it was an interesting situation because it wasn't like you think back to Hent Vabelhem last year, where you have a group of eight sprinters plus Kung plus two Yumbo, flat run into the finish. Here we have a lot of aggressive riders and none of them really want to go to the sprint with Wout. We have the Peloton just before, and we've got a pretty easy finish now, 12Ks. We've got the Peloton behind, not that far. And Bosberg. And Bosberg. But uh, Bosberg's not too <laughs> decisive in my view. Yeah. But I was thinking Van Aert should sit up. Not sit up, but he should be like, get three men around him, get a lead out going sprint easy dub and i still think that might have worked but he actually put the pressure on again and created a smaller group and dropped tash benoit and i was like he's isolating himself here campanats i think attacked and then van Aert just rolled off the front benji cancellara style i couldn't <laughs> and believe nobody it reacts. <laughs> nobody maybe they couldn't yeah but there has to have been someone that it wasn't like an attack of like oh i'm gonna throw 1,400 watts for 15 seconds and sprint away from this group. It was like he was riding away on the left side of the road and nobody jumped on the wheel. And he was like, I've got a gap, might as well keep going. And it this was before the Bosberg. And I think that did help that Bosberg because Bernard is one of the better cobblers in that group, which means that if he gets to that Bosberg, he's likely going to expand this gap the second he gets on it. And the fact that he's got no one in his wheel, he doesn't need to think about the others, you know? He can just hammer it and then hope that his gap is significant enough after the Bosberg to keep going 
add to that point. But the danger is like Goldbrelli was in that group behind and he's got teammates there and that yep. came into play after the Bolsberg when the gap went up to roughly, what was it, 20 seconds at first and 30 seconds. But Mohoric was in that group and I think Fred Wright as well. So two riders for yep. Goldbrelli. And I'd argue that almost the entire group was pacing for a good five-ish kilometers when it comes to the teams, except at a certain point, Van Avermaet came into second position after, I think, his teammate Nasnal already did the turn. And Van Avermaet didn't take over from the rider in front and looked at the rider and was like, nope, I'm not going to take over. And I'm like, you're riding for a second then, okay? Because, like, w- what are you doing? You're blocking the cooperation in this group. You're ruining it for everyone in the group. You're ruining your chance of winning. So I guess you're riding for a second. Yeah, and I think... It's interesting because I was like, oh, be conservative, go back for the sprint. Well, wow. but all last year we were saying he's the best time trialist that does one day races because Ghana hasn't really yeah. done any cobbles. Well, wow. Vanat's the best time trialist, and that ability that he has is more significantly better than his sprint against, you know, he, he can lose a sprint to even Pagatra or Pigcock on his day, whereas TT wise, just a just a monster and he went cancellara mode and i guess an analogy is if you're a gc rider and you feel good and you're on a climb and you think you can take time take the time and today he felt like i can i'm good here i can attack or just get away and also we've been watching the last year the cooperation in in groups behind you just got to hold the gap that's all he did for ages benji he just held it at 12 yeah. And then eventually, as you said, someone's going to be like, eh, yeah. I think I'll protect for a second. And then it's done. And then maybe they I, they probably wouldn't have even brought him back anyway because he, he was so strong in this finish. So, yes. as you know, Van Aert takes the win solo, 13K solo in Omelupet Nosblad, ahead of Colbrelli, who takes second in the bunch sprint off, wins the bunch sprint for second. Van Avermaet third, Narsen fourth, Campanats fifth, Rasmus Tiller sixth, and Trentin Pasqualon Seneschal Sturven rounding out the top ten. But Jumbo Visma, a different team with Teish Benoit, Benji, and Turnison back. Yeah, it's a very different team. It's a stronger team. They cooperate better uh, in the sense that they have riders to cooperate with this year. <laughs> well, let's be honest about it. And um, I think Fanat also rode slightly differently this year. And I feel like last year we saw him more doing basing that he didn't need to do than today, I would say. There was still a little bit of it, a little yeah. bit. Just after the Moor, I was like, you probably don't need to pull when Benoit's dropping off the group. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but this is a massive improvement compared to him closing quick step attacks with 65 kilometers to go. Yeah. Like we're talking, we're at least in the final here, whereas <laughs> he hasn't hit the wind before then and he was way fresh and yeah. I think it made a difference. We have to acknowledge, of course, there is no MVDP here. There's no probably inform Asgren or Alaphilippe here as well. I do think that makes a difference because MVDP is so, and Peak Asgren are so evenly matched with Van Aert. So say he... If MVP is here, Benji, in good form, Van Aert's not rolling off the front of that group. 100%. Van der Poel is in his wheel. Yeah. So it, it makes a huge difference. I do think Ineos will be thinking, should we have finessed and then Benoit when uh, maybe they try to get too cute with it. I don't know. But, yeah, huge win for well, Van Aert. Do, are you worried, Benji, as a Belgian, that he's, he's peaking too soon? The Ronda curse. How's he going to carry his form? I'm not necessarily just based on his own words because his own words are that he's still not where he needs to be and that's kind of scary for the opposition, I think. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he just came out of altitude camp and he's uh, looking to try and better his form a few percent towards the actual races that count. He's working for a leader in Paris, apparently, according to him. So um, that means that we won't see him doing a Tireno like last year, doing crazy stuff on a, a crazy stage like Castel Fidardo. And that might also weaken a rider in uh, the long term. So if he does keep himself to that rule where he doesn't cross the the edge, where he doesn't do too much in those weeks, I think he should be all right. And uh, we said it in the Umbo preview before the year, this is the year he needs to do it with the squad. 
and I honestly think that it's looking very good at the moment compared to Quickstep, who I actually don't know what they can do this year. Like, sure, Asgreen's form is not to be seen, but I've got a feeling that I've never seen Lampard as a Classics winning rider. Sorry, people. I don't mean this insulting or anything, but he always missed something. And always someone's better. So I never saw him as a leader, per se. Is that wrong to say? No, I think he's a quick step system rider. And he's not like he's not as good as Greg Van Avermaet. He's probably the same as like Oliver Narsen. Uh I think Van Avermaet's better, sorry, I think significantly than him. And yeah, he's a system rider. And without a sprint option, yep. like a genuine one, like Ballerini they had last year without Peak Asgren or Al Philippe, Quick Step, yeah, didn't look the same. This is just on loop though. We don't need to overreact too much. It's a long classics season. There's E3, Han Vabelhem, Dwarsdor, RVV, Roubaix. We'll have Yumbo Visma shown their hand a little bit earlier. I would expect Quick Step to be stronger, particularly with Al Philippe and Asgren later. But that was men's on loop. Big win for Van Art and Yumbo. And otherwise, Campanats, I think the big surprise of the day. He's looking really good too for Lotto yeah. Sudal, and they didn't have Dali. And Wellens pulled out with sickness beforehand, which was a bummer for them. He was absolutely flying. Now on to women's Omlu Pet Nurse Blood, where AVV was maybe the strongest rider on the start list. We had Chloe Dygert here, but the strongest team was SD Works with Kopecky, Vanderbrook Black, Cicchini, Unikin, Royce, and Volering other notable riders being, of course, Grace Brown for FD Shea and Nivea Doma for Canyon Shram. And Lippert for DSM, too. They have Vibes there as a sprint option. Defensively, too. Balsamo, the world champ for Trek with Eleanor Backstep and Longa Borghini. But when live coverage started, we saw, I think, about 31 Ks to go. Or maybe the Leiburg a group with Lippert. Van Dyke, Royce, and Anna Henderson going clear with no Voss at this race for Yumbo. And what do you think the dynamic is with that group bench? You've got two time trellis, an all rounder, and Henderson's uh, an emerging classics rider. Well, that's a bit intriguing. Like on paper, I would argue that Henderson is the faster sprinter of the four riders. So if these four would make it to the line at some point, with it, which it looked like at a certain point because the gap was pretty significant about five minutes before the mirror, over a minute and so forth. And then we have Van Dijk and Reuser, the TTers, but Van Dijk, a bit of a better sprint, I would argue, than Reuser as well. Lippert, I actually don't have a good feeling about her sprint. I don't know what you think her sprint is like, L- Lippert. I think it's pretty good. I think okay. it's better uphill, better for sure. Uh, but I thought she would have been, her and Henderson, the best in that group. And then they could have yep. beaten the time trials. In. And I thought she'd probably attack even on the Moor. Yeah, but uh, we immediately saw before the Moor, when I tuned in with about 22 kilometers to go, that the gap has already gone down from like, like I said, more than a minute to it was like 30 seconds when the Moor was about to start. And that's not enough. <laughs> and there's a rider in the peloton that had her team pacing, Movistar van Vleuten, and next to that, FDG for their riders and Van Vleuten was going to launch it like we knew it weeks ago that when the Mur comes Van Vleuten's going to launch it so the Mur was there and Van Vleuten was about to launch it and she started hammering it the gap went down significantly immediately Anderson was dropping from the front group so three riders left Van Dijk, Reuser, Lippert they would actually make it to the top as a three rider uh, group and Van Vleuten to be honest there was uh, quite a few riders that tried to follow her Following was the one that was able to stick onto her wheel quite a bit towards the top of the uh, Kapelmuir as well. Kopecky could follow for half of it, but towards the end of that climb, it looked like Kopecky was dropping and she was on a bit of a gap there. So that was a bit, ah, as a Belgian fan with a Belgian jersey on, I was like, okay, uh, she needs to uh, get that 1% more to get back to the wheel at that point. And that's where the intrigue comes in. We were speaking on the SD Works podcast that Kopecky is a very valuable rider for this squad because now Volring can just say to uh, Van Vleuten, well, I won't work. I've got Kopecky behind. And Reuser at the front and that three uh, women group can say, well, I won't work because I've got 
Volring and Kopecky behind. So both two groups at the front did not have to pace the SD Works riders, at least, because Kopecky was trying to come back. And eventually, Van Vleuten and uh, Volring did make it to that front breakaway because, uh, well, the cooperation in the front group was first not that great. And then eventually, uh, Van Vleuten reached to that group and then the cooperation there wasn't great. So eventually, Kopecky came back to the group and we had three SD Works riders in the in the group there. What did you think about the strategy so far of SD Works? Looking good. Looking like textbook stuff. They've got the quickest rider in the group, Kopecky. They've got a TT rider who can maybe close moves on the flat and pace. They've got Volering for the lead out and to mark AVV and who's fast too. Looking really good. And... I think they couldn't have drawn it up better. Maybe Kopecky was a little bit ruined. She looked very tired <laughs> getting to that group after the moor. And <laughs> she, you can see her on the radio. Like if they didn't have team radios, Royce would have kept pacing and she yeah. would have been off the back. So maybe that played it. The, the length of time for her to get back to the group before the Bosberg, it took a long time. And from the Bosberg, it's pretty much, well, yeah, it's like 13, 12 and a half Ks of false flat downhill to the finish. And the Bosberg is not that severe, but if the group is tired, it can make a difference. At 1K at 5.5%, but there's like a 200-metre section that's steep, 12%, 13%, apparently. And I didn't see that. I didn't know that. That's well, steeper than I expected. <laughs> I know. I thought it was a little bit less severe than that. This according to the PCS, the Flamme Rouge readout. But, yeah. Uh, and anyway, that's the last climb. AVV is like... If I don't attack, SD Works going to go on the front and they're going to set up a, a lead out for Kopecky and Kopecky is probably going to win. And AVV launches it on the Bosberg and initially the group behind, Royce is gone, Kopecky's holding okay, so is Lippert, but then she gets a gap and only Vollering can keep AVV's wheel over the Bosberg and then Vollering sitting on. I'm like, well... Again, perfect for SD Works. AVV is yeah. going to sit up because she's not going to tow Volering to the line and then Kopecky can come back. Nope. AVV literally does an ITT like Van Hart, except she had Volering on her wheel <laughs> the entire time to the finish. And whatever the result was, Benji, I was just like, is this good tactics? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, like I'm trying not to be results orientated here, but I, at the time I didn't think it was. I'll be honest, put my hand up. But like, a, what can she do? Because like, if she sits up, then Kopecky's back in the group in the exactly. exact situation she attacked from. So exactly, I think she was like, "Oh, I'm gonna lose if I stay anyway, so I might as well attack." And if I lose, then I lose. But at least I had a fun ride. <laughs> I think there's also something to AVV being like, I can hurt people on my wheel. Like yep. if she's like, if I keep the tempo high after Bosberg, no recovery, I can keep following under pressure and deaden her legs before a sprint. And I think she's like, maybe maybe she didn't, but maybe she's just like, AVV strong, what smash? <laughs> like that's also an option, but maybe she was like, I rate myself if I've tied out following over sprinting against Quebec in a group. And anyway, we get to the finish. She eventually, with like two Ks to go, the gaps exploded because SC Works don't help behind because the race situation is pretty good for them with following. He's fast. She won a couple of sprints last year against uh, Voss and Van Vluten. They yep. sit again. Gaps a minute. Voss, uh, Van Vluten's like, can you pull? Volering's like, no. Volering eventually <laughs> leads into the last 400 meters. Got the chicane. And AVV opens up her sprint at about the time that I think Seneschal began his lead out for Ballerini in Omloop last year with like 350. Uh, earlier, go. earlier. Really? Yeah. I think, <laughs> so uh, early. Seneschal launched it like halfway the road that she was launching towards in that yes. corner. Yeah, exactly. And to be honest, at that point, I was like, oh, how can Von Lurten yep. win this? I was surprised <laughs> that Volring came to the front, by the way. Yeah, I know. Because that's the only thing that made it vulnerable for the attack of, like, through that corner of Van Vleuten. But Volering was fast to react, and then uh, the sprint started happening. Who came out on top? Well, yeah, Volering's had to close just off the wheel through the S. It opens up with 200. AVV just launches arms and elbows and knees all over the place. 
And she and you can just see it was like look Shenko against poles the other day. I was like, she's not coming out of that wheel. And Vollering came to the side, didn't move up at all. And AVV, she kept kicking through the line. She like didn't even stop at the line just about and destroys Vollering in the sprint. City. <laughs> yeah, it was similar. Just incredible dominance from Van Lurten winning this. Just with everything stacked against her. With the parkour not having the Molenberg, with SD Works, yes, Van der Breggen's retired, but their team is so stacked. And with Vollering sitting on it for 12K, she wins this sprint against Vollering. With Vibers in the group behind, 25 seconds behind, destroyed Balsamo and everyone else. She's looking fast. Lorena Vibers, uh, Balsamo fourth, Coponi fifth for FDJ, then Emma Norsgaard, Anna Henderson, Confalonieri. Bastianelli and Julie Leth for Unox rounding up the top ten. So yeah, Henderson finishing in that group pretty good after being in that in that move. But AVV Benji, scary stuff. She was saying she was struggling to walk properly like three months ago. Yeah, it's scary stuff, and it kind of reminds me of when Wout van Aert came back from his injury and already started hammering it on Stade Bianca that year. And it kind of feels like that same recovery into straight up dominating the races they start. And it's ruthless, but it's great to see. It's great to see because I'm not going to lie. I 100% thought that Volering had it. I was like, she's been faster the entire year last year. Von Vleuten has one good sprint every so like five races or something. She's decent at 1v1s. Perhaps that will finesse it. But nah, I thought Volering had it. I'm surprised. Yeah, I think I think AVV, as I said, I might be giving her too much credit, but I think she actually played it the best because of Kapeki and the group behind. And they, they only won by 25 seconds. So if she sits up and Vibers comes back, <laughs> she's not winning that, is she? So <laughs> pretty, pretty crazy stuff from AVV, who I think is going to run the table this year just about particularly in the stage races. She's doing Giro, Tour de France fan by Avex Swift, La Vuelta, Amstel, Liège, Flesh, Ronde van Vlander and Strada next week. Jesus. Wow. Anyway, SD Works, Benji, do you think they need to change anything? I don't need to, I don't think they need to change anything. They just had a, a better rider on the road today, I would argue. And the only thing that they have in their mind now is that they won't be as sure about following Sprint for the coming races. And that might play into the dynamics of groups and so forth, because Kopecky was valuable for them to not ride in multiple groups. But if Volring is in the front group and Kopecky's in the second group, and Kopecky says in the second group, I'm not riding because Volring's at the front, but the others in that group will realize, well, Volring lost the sprint to Van Vleuten last time. So do you really trust her? <laughs> and that could like ruin a bit of the, I don't know, cooperation. But she couldn't do anything else. Like she has to mark yeah. AVV on Bosberg, and then she didn't pull. So what else can they do? Nothing, Nothing really. It's just Kopecky's got to make the split or something. I don't know. Because if you let AVV go, then it's curtains. So, yeah, I think there's nothing really either of them could have done differently. But that was a huge Omloop opening Saturday. Kerner tomorrow, which we'll be covering over in Gran Camino, Valverde won a hilly stage against Woods in a sort of downhill sprint. But it looking good too. So, so good GC work, it must be said. Oh, sorry, domestique work for Bala. Uh, and full sang for Woods. But there's a TT there tomorrow, a hilly one, which should be pretty... I actually have no idea. how. <laughs> I think Bala's going to be better than Woods on paper, but that's one to sort of monitor. There was also Fournard Desch where Brandon McNulty... Big day for UAE, continues his one-day form. He's looking, remember, Olympics last year. Then he won uh, Trofea Calvia and was top five in two other of the New Yorkan races. And then he was solo, I think, in that Mercian race. Mercia, yeah. Wins for Nardesh handily ahead of Maori Van Sevenant, who beats Koos. I think that's going to be Koos' best ever one-day result. Third. Uh, 45 seconds behind. Kamna fourth, Guillaume Martin fifth, and Chambre saint pacher Buggy, Carmejean, Viermoz rounding out the top 10. Roglic, I think, was in that larger group of those guys I just mentioned. So, 
McNulty, Benji, I reckon he's got to be a, an option for Liège or Amstel, the way he's riding now. Yeah, I'd argue yes. 100% not for Flesh in my eyes, because that's no, like for actual no acceleration punchers. But I'd say LBL is definitely an option. Nonetheless, I don't think that he's going to be leader there because they've got no. Ade, Ade Pogo stick in their team. <laughs> he's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good rider. So uh, They shoot. can use him like a note. Use him as to make other teams, you know, he's got the TT, yeah. make other teams chase. I think he can do that. I agree with you. Yes. All right, so big Saturday. We're exhausted. Hope you enjoyed it all. Is Wout Van Aert going to run the table? Is AVV going to run the table? Probably a hot take to say she won't at this point. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Zwift for supporting the podcast, and we'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Ciao.